Well, hello and welcome. We have made it to week 15, getting really close to the end of the semester. And this is where we're diving into some new material about hypothesis testing. And we are going to use the five steps of hypothesis testing that I told you about last week as our guide to work through three new hypothesis tests. Now, let me remind you of these five steps of hypothesis testing. Number one is we select the appropriate test, and we'll do that based upon the kind of data that we have. We'll establish a null and alternative hypothesis appropriate to the test that we've chosen. Then we'll select a criterion for statistical significance. You may remember that I showed you three ways that we can determine statistical significance. And then number four, we'll run the test. I'm going to show you how to run the uh, specific tests in uh, Excel, in JASP, and uh, one of them we'll even do by hand. And then step five would be to interpret the results and write up the findings in APA style. The three tests that we are going to learn about this week are a one-sample z-test, which we use when we know the standard deviation of the population, a one-sample t-test, which we use when we do not know the standard deviation of the population, and a proportions test. Each of those tests we will do using our five steps of hypothesis testing. We're going to begin when we know the mean of the population and also know the standard deviation of the population using a one-sample z-test. So we might ask, what is a one-sample z-test? It is a parametric procedure that we use to test whether a sample mean is statistically significantly different than a population mean when we know the standard deviation of the population, or sigma. Now, in this, in this example with the polar bears, you can see we have a population that has a mean of 100 and a sample drawn from that population. The population standard deviation is known. It's a measure of 11. The sample will also have a standard deviation, but we won't need that for any of our calculations if we know the mean and standard deviation of the population, the mean of the sample, and the sample size. That's where we're going to use that one sample z-test. Here are some settings, uh, some assumptions that we need to know about as we are using our one sample z-test. Now the first is the independent and dependent variables. As you might determine from a one sample z-test, we have one sample. The sample participants should be randomly selected. We'll use a dependent variable, which is something that we measure. It could be height or weight or diameter of ball bearings or some other measure that we can calculate a mean. Add up all the scores, divide by n, that gives us our average, our mean. We have one variable, it has one group, and something has been measured that we can add up to get a mean. There's a few other assumptions that we'll want to check. We need to make sure that we don't have any extreme outliers in our data set, no missing data in our data set, and those two assumptions are going to be met uh, because I'm going to provide you with clean data. But if you're using your own data, it's important that you check those assumptions for your test before you begin. And then we'll be looking at the assumptions for independence and normality. The independence assumption can be checked uh, as part of your research design, and the normality can be checked typically with, with software that you're using, uh, whether it be Excel, uh, really easy to do in JASP. We have tests for that in SPSS or R. We have lots of options and for checking the normality. It's a simple check, and you may recall that with assumptions checks, we prefer that the assumption check be non-significant, because that means that our data do not differ from the assumptions. We want them to not be statistically significantly different. However, many times it's great when we do have statistical significance when we're measuring the mean of our sample compared to, our state, to, to the mean of our population. The settings that we'll want to be aware of for the null hypothesis, in words we would say that the sample mean is equal to the population mean, and in symbols we would describe this as h sub zero colon mu equals mu sub zero and where it says mu sub zero that's where we're actually going to plug in a number which is the mean of the population. 
our alternative hypothesis is h sub 1 colon mu does not equal h sub 0. And again, we'll plug in a number for that h sub 0 value. The alpha level is typically a 0.05, which for a z-test, if we're using a two-tailed test, our critical value will be a 1.96, positive or negative, because there's two tails. And if we're using a one-tailed test, the critical value will be either a positive 1.645 or a negative 1.645, depending on which tail we're interested in. So with that as our setup, let's take a look at an example that I want to show you about social media. Now these are the average ages for people on social networks and online communities. And you can see some of these uh, may be familiar. Uh, we still have MySpace included in this example. Uh, and some of the other ones like uh, LinkedIn, a uh, little older. Researchers at the website Pingdom collected an average age of social users of social media websites and found that the average age of social network users in the United States is 36.9 with a standard deviation of 10. And I'll just tell you, I, I made up that standard deviation as part of this example. They didn't actually calculate that. But I needed it for a z-test and I needed to have a standard deviation, so that's where the number actually comes from. The distribution is approximately normal you obtain a sample of 25 users of the social networking site LinkedIn. The average age for this sample is 44.2 years old. And our research question is, is the average age of your sample of LinkedIn users different from the United States population of social network users? You can tell already from that research question, we're asking, is our sample different than our population? Because we're not asking, are they older, are they younger, our directional hypothesis. We're simply asking, are they different? This is a non-directional hypothesis using a two-tailed test. Let's start working through our five steps of hypothesis testing, beginning with step number one, to choose the appropriate test. Let's look at the data that we have, and that's going to help us decide what type of test to use. We have a sample, we have a population, we know the mean and the standard deviation of the population, we have a sample size. This is a setup for doing a one sample z-test. And that in fact is the test that we're going to do. And I will tell you as we're learning the five steps of hypothesis testing, step number one is always going to be the easiest because the answer will probably be when you're asked what test should I use, Whatever test we're learning right now, because I'm teaching you about a z-test, probably not a spoiler to say that's the test that we're going to choose for this example. Step number two is to define our null and alternative hypothesis, and that we need to know what type of test we're using because that's going to influence what hypotheses we choose. Well, the null hypothesis would be, in words, that LinkedIn users' age is no different than the average user. And in symbols, we would write that as h sub 0 colon mu equals 36.9. This is where we plug in the number that is the mean of the population. So the population mean is 36.9. We plug that in for our null hypothesis. For our alternative hypothesis, we would say in words that LinkedIn user's age is different than the average user. And in symbols, we would write that as h sub 1 colon, you may also use h sub a colon, mu does not equal 36.9. Now that is the setup for a two-tailed test, which is exactly what we're going to use. If, however, you were going to use a one-tailed test, we might say something like this. The LinkedIn users are older than the average user. We're establishing a direction of change, and therefore this alternative hypothesis would be written in symbols as h sub 2 colon mu does not equal 36.9. Now we're going to establish our criteria for statistical significance. Let's click, quickly review the settings that we've already chosen. We are doing a two-tailed test we will set our alpha level to the typical 0.05, giving us a critical value because we are using a normal distribution 
of positive or negative 1.96. Well, these are the settings that we need. We're now ready for step four to calculate the statistics. Let me show you the formula that we would be using before I show you how we will actually do this. This is a formula for a z-test, and you can see where all of the pieces get plugged in. We have the mean of the sample, the mean of the population, both of those go in the numerator. In the denominator, we have the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. That denominator, the sigma divided by the square root of n, is also called the standard error of the mean. And this is our denominator, our error term for a z-test. Here is how we would calculate this by hand. The first thing we would do is find the standard error of the mean. So our standard deviation is 10, and our sample size is 25. We would therefore divide 10 by the square root of 25, which of course is 5, giving us a standard error of the mean of 2.0. That we will plug into the rest of our formula. The mean of the sample is 44.2. The mean of the population is 36.9. Subtract those, we get 7.3. Divide that by 2, our standard error of the mean, gives us a value of 3.65. That is our z value or for the z test. So that is the number that we're going to compare to our critical value of 1.96. We can see already that 3 is larger than 1.96, so this test is statistically significant. Another way that you might choose to do this z-test is by using the normal distribution multi-tool that I provided for you in the class, or it's available in the link in the description of this video. Go to the tab for the z-test. And here you will find places to fill in each of the elements of the z-test things that we already know. For instance, we'll put the population mean in as 36.9. The sample mean is 44.2. Our sample size is 25. And the population standard deviation is 10. Click on the click here to calculate, which is just a, an empty box, it just gets you to click somewhere else outside of the cell. And now we have a z-value of 3.65. You'll notice that our level of significance has been preset at 0.05. However, you can change that value to 0 0.01, 0 0.10, any other level of significance that you would choose. Below this blue box, you'll see we have a critical value for a two-tailed z-test at 1.96. That's the value that we're using. If we were using a one-tailed z-test, we would have a critical value of 1.645. And the spreadsheet also tells us whether or not a two-tailed test or a one-tailed test would be statistically significant. The greenish colored box gives us some probabilities. So what is the probability of obtaining a z-score of 3.65 if the null hypothesis was true? That probability is 0 0.0003 for the two-tailed test. The 95% confidence interval, we could see listed in the blue boxes toward the bottom of this box. And if you were to change the confidence interval from a 0.95 to a 0 0.90 or even a 0.99, those values would change. Those are the findings for this test. What we see is that the sample mean is over the fence. It's in the region of rejection. This tells us that our test is statistically significant, that the sample mean is statistically significantly different from the population mean. And therefore, we would reject the null hypothesis, the hypothesis that says there's no difference. If we reject a hypothesis that says no difference, we are then assuming that there is a difference. And that difference is statistically significant. Now we can write up our findings in APA style. A study was conducted to determine whether users of the social networking site LinkedIn are significantly different in age than typical users of social networking sites. A z-test was used to compare the average age of a sample of 25 LinkedIn users with a mean of 44.2, 
to the average age of social networking users. Mean of 36.9, standard deviation of 10. LinkedIn users are significantly older than the typical social networking user. A Z of positive 3.65, probability less than 0 0.05, reflecting the business and corporate focus of the site. So that is how we would do a one sample Z test, both by hand or by using an Excel spreadsheet. Next, we're going to learn about other ways that we could do hypothesis testing, particularly when we do not know the standard deviation of the population.